welcome everyone to this week's episode, kindly sponsored by Audible. And as you can see, Audible knows me pretty well. It's recommending me a number of excellent books. This one I referenced quite heavily in paper form in my Pearl Harbor video. And this one, Neptune's Inferno, again, a keystone of the Guadalcanal series, both absolutely excellent. And now you can listen to them as well. And then if you go further over here, well, oh, that looks like there's one on Collingwood. I might pick that up. And if you're interested in a particular audiobook, you can listen to an excerpt of the narration ahead of time. So particularly appropriate to this week's video. For a moment, the Admiral's lineage teetered on the brink of destitution, at a time when few social structures protected the innocents left behind after death stole the family provider. Then it soared to new heights. And then, of course, you might not want to be listening at your computer. You might want to actually go out and do something with your day. So if you happen to find yourself walking along on a rare sunny day in the UK, like we are now, then you can choose any number of audiobook options and just hit play. And then just keep on walking, taking in knowledge, listening to your favourite fiction, and, well, enjoying life. So if you want to give it a shot, then, well, why not let Audible help you discover new ways to laugh, be inspired, or be entertained? New members can try Audible for free for 30 days by visiting audible.com slash Drakinafel or texting Drakinafel to 500-500. So with thanks to Audible once again, let's get on with the show. 1944 looked like it would be ending on a high note for the US Navy in the Pacific. A series of campaigns had either been successfully concluded that year, or, in the latter part of the year, begun. The Japanese strongholds of Rabaul and Truk were largely neutralised and bypassed, and the Imperial Japanese Navy had seen most of its remaining strength destroyed with minimal US casualties in a series of engagements, the largest two of which were the Battle of the Philippine Sea and the three battles collectively termed the Battle of Leyte Gulf, these being Samar, Cape Engano and Surigao Strait. The first had destroyed much of Japan's remaining carrier force, and the latter had collectively taken out half the remaining battleships, including the giant Musashi, which meant that apart from Yamato, this was leaving them with only the Nagato, a pair of converted hybrids, and a single battle cruiser once USS Sea Lion had picked off Congo at the end of November. All of Japan's pre-war fleet carrier force was also now gone, as was the bulk of their wartime production. Taiho having gone down earlier in the year, and the as net yet unknown to the US Shinano having been sunk by USS Archerfish within a few days of the sinking of Congo. All that was left of the once mighty Kido Butai was a small collection of hasty conversions and a handful of freshly painted Unryu class, with not even enough carrier qualified pilots to fill the full air complement of one of the latter. So, aside from the increasingly annoying kamikaze attacks, it seemed that the days of major US Navy losses were over. There would still be casualties, of course, but nothing that could render significant damage or destruction to a force like Task Force 38, unless everyone collectively took a day off from anti-aircraft gunner duties. Task Force 38, sometimes known as the Third Fleet, had itself been at something of a loose end after the battles of Leyte Gulf. With no major naval opposition, it had spent most of November providing air cover for the ongoing campaign in the Philippines, largely due to deteriorating weather conditions that had turned what ashore air bases that had been captured into seas of gloopy mud too liquid for wheeled aircraft to do anything more than slowly sink out of sight in, and just too solid and sticky for somebody to put a Catalina down. And when the landing conditions preclude even Catalina operations, you know it's got to be bad. By mid-December, while still getting used to dealing with the Japanese having apparently concluded that if US anti-aircraft cover was making massed attacks on the fleet suicidal, then they would lean right into that suicidal idea, TF-38 had become a truly mighty formation. Seven Essex-class carriers and six Independence-class light carriers constituted more carrier-based air power in one location than the entire pre-war US Navy could have mustered. Eight battleships, four heavy cruisers, eleven light cruisers, and a half century of destroyers accompanied them. Associated with, but not a direct part of Task Force 38, were of course further ships, troop transports, escort carriers, and various other surface warships plus submarines, and of course the vital replenishment vessels, but these were mostly off on their own assignments at this point. By this stage, many of Task Force 38 ships had depleted their fuel bunkers quite considerably, 
and so the entire force was ordered to commence refuelling operations. This was a fairly normal procedure. By taking the fleet into the deep ocean, it was very unlikely they would be interrupted by enemy activity. But it also temporarily left some ships considerably more vulnerable to rough seas than they would otherwise have been, especially the destroyers. US Navy fleet destroyers were not necessarily the most stable bunch. Many of the interwar designs had tried to squeeze every last possible drop of weaponry out of hulls that simply displaced too little for the goals that people had in mind for them. In one case, the Sims class, the newly building ships had even had to have equipment removed to ensure they'd stay upright fresh out of dock. The Fletcher class were considerably better at this, offering a marginal increase in overall firepower to compare to some of the interwar designs, but on a much larger and much more stable hull. But all of these ships had had their stability pushed to the limit by the addition of a plethora of new systems, mostly radar and anti-aircraft guns and the associated systems and crew that came with them. Some of them had even sacrificed torpedo launchers, or even a 5-inch gun, in order to allow the new equipment aboard. But many now faced a situation similar to that encountered by a number of pre-war German destroyer designs, albeit that the Kriegsmarine ships had come out of the dockyard without upgrades, but with these issues. And this was simply that the ships would only remain acceptably stable in rough seas if their fuel tanks were mostly full. Set deep in the ship, precisely for stability, and also because the boilers happened to be down there, a typical US destroyer of the period might carry something in the order of 25% or more of its total fully loaded displacement just in fuel. USS Hull, a smaller Farragut-class destroyer for example, notionally displaced 1,365 tonnes standard, fresh out of the yard, but by this point was displacing just over 2,000 tonnes fully loaded, and of that latter load, up to 600 tonnes of it might be fuel oil. Removing much of this mass from so low in the ship deeply upset a ship's stability, and this was already a known factor. US captains had refused a number of upgrades to the Farraguts that would have added additional top weight relatively recently. They also, therefore, had a policy of filling empty fuel tanks with seawater. This maintained stability as the seawater acted as ballast. The tanks would then be flushed out when it came time to refuel. This, of course, being the era before environmental impact analysis papers were a thing. The problem, of course, was that if you were preparing to refuel, all of your tanks would be flushed and you'd be riding high at near enough your least stable position. Thanks to the fact that oil and water stayed separate, you could also flood partially filled tanks to increase your ballast, although this was generally only done in exceptional circumstances. But this issue with, st with stability was the situation faced by a number of US ships on the 17th of December 1944. Meanwhile, anyone passing east or southeast of Guam a week or two earlier would have noted that the pressure on their barometers was dropping and the sea temperatures were rising. A typhoon was forming, one of unusual power and surprisingly compact size, at least for a typhoon, and it was gathering energy and heading towards the Philippines. The US Navy wasn't a complete stranger to the dangers of typhoons. One of them, after all, had wrecked three of its ships at Samoa toward the end of the 19th century, rather forcibly diffusing a simmering conflict between the USA and Germany by the expedient of swatting everything that had tried to ride out its fury. Taking advantages of improvements to weather forecasting spurred by the First World War and the advent of aircraft operations as well as gas attacks, the Navy had invested over the years in improving its weather forecasting capability. In this case, the first signs of serious trouble came courtesy of a PBM-3 Mariner flying boat. There was a weather station with a reporting and forecasting team based on Saipan, and this aircraft, attached to the seaplane tender Chandelure, was doing its part to keep an eye on the elements. Weather spotting flights themselves were relatively rare, but patrolling aircraft had standing orders to note weather conditions on their patrol routes quite regularly, and to let the relevant teams know if they happened to spot anything unusual. Thus, when the aircraft noted a building storm system with winds exceeding 65 knots around midnight on the night of the 16th through 17th, it radioed in the position, 
13 degrees north, 132 degrees east, about 250 miles southeast of Task Force 38. A few hours later, another mariner belonging to the same unit, VPN-21, reported the same cloud formation. Aboard the seaplane tender, Lieutenant Junior Grade Robert W. Young took notice of the two reports and duly noted a typhoon warning in his collected reports, which were then sent on to Saipan. As the morning of the 17th dawned, though, Task Force 38 was blissfully ignorant of all of this. With some of the destroyers down to 24 hours of fuel, their main focus was on the replenishment operation. Ensign M. Dick Van Orden was aboard the light carrier USS Independence that day. Replenishment day was always a welcome day of respite from the rigors of war. A pleasant time in a safe zone where there was temporary relief from the interminable recurrences of general quarters, torpedo defense, flight quarters, and other necessary activities of an alert, ever-ready force within range of enemy aircraft. It was a holiday from the tensions, the incessant alerts, and the stresses that came from day after day of watch standing, steaming offshore, launching airstrikes, recovering aircraft, sometimes shot full of holes, and performing necessary day-to-day maintenance and upkeep of ships and aircraft. A holiday spirit prevailed throughout the task group on these special days. Station keeping was a bit more lax, and gun crews were off duty so that the gunners could lubricate, adjust, and boresight their guns. Sailors were free to laze about on the decks with shorts off, smoke went not actually alongside the oil or the ammo ship, and absorbed the sun's welcome warm rays. Unfortunately, not all replenishment days were peaceful or relaxing. The weather occasionally didn't cooperate, and the development of storms, which could slip in undetected, spoiled some planned operations, including those necessary replenishment appointments. Although the meteorologists, called aerologists or aerological offices, or sometimes weather guesses in those days, did their best with the limited information available to them, uh, but they frequently missed on the predictions of the weather. The flagship had a weather guesser aboard, as did each of the carriers. These men frequently conferred by radio before making a joint forecast and notifying the ships of their estimates of future conditions. Sometimes, however, they didn't have enough information to predict accurately, so their joint forecasts were wrong. Task Force 38 was about 500 miles east of the Philippines, well out of reach of almost any Japanese aircraft, and sufficiently away from all land that any especially suicidal aircraft would find locating the fleet almost impossible. But submarines were another matter, so whilst a minimal combat air patrol was maintained, the destroyers that had more fuel aboard ran an anti-submarine picket line around the fleet. The sea conditions had grown a little bit heavier than they had been overnight, but operations continued as normal, with some destroyers running mail duty, shuttling between the various ships distributing the latest in letters and parcels sent from home, and brought out by the replenishment ships of Task Group 30.8. Also important were replacement pilots who needed to be taken to their carriers. But the seas continued to rise, even as the refueling operations commenced. The view from Independence was typical. The carriers always went alongside the tankers first. Their needs for avgas took priority over everything else. Independence, CV-22, operating only night fighters and night searches, returned from her solo all-night operations, which placed a heavy demand on her fuel and avgas, and was given priority so as to be able to get her drink and was given priority so as to be able to get hoy drink at Foist Light. She approached a heavily laden tanker that was wallowing in the seas and taking green water over the bow. The chief warrant bosun on a foredeck of Indy shook his head in disbelief at the rough conditions and said to me, his divo, this is going to be rough. I ordered all of my division on the foredeck crew to put on life jackets and safety lines as they set about getting the tow line over to the tanker. In those days, it was customary to use a tow line from the carrier to the tanker. It was not actually used for towing, but mainly served as a breast line to assist the officer of the deck in maintaining a safe position. Many ships' commanding officers were fearful of the suction caused by the Bernoulli effect, two ships' hulls proceeding close to get on a parallel course at the same speed. 
The tow line therefore enabled the officer on deck to hold a slight port rudder, we always refueled on the starboard side, throughout the refueling period, keeping pressure on a tow line and thus avoiding getting too close and having the ships be sucked together, which would cause topside damage to both. Later in the war it was determined that the tow line was unnecessary since an attentive officer on deck and a good helmsman could keep the ships apart. In this way, the Boinuli effect would not come into play unless the ships came very close together. Independence used an 8-inch middle hawser for a tow line. Hawsers of that size are designated by their diameter, in this case 8 inches. The hawser was heavy and unwieldy, and the deck crew struggled manfully on this wet, stormy morning to get it ready for passing over to the oiler. After several tries, the tow line throwing gun got the white line over, and it was attached to the heaving line, which was attached to a 3-inch manila, which was attached to the 8-inch tow line. When the tow line was pulled over and made fast to the oiler, the hoses went over and the fueling began. Before long, the bosun asked me to call a bridge and report that the strain on the tow line was excessive. He recommended fuel and be terminated as soon as possible. I conveyed the message, but the need for avgas was critical, so the officer at the deck said we should continue as long as we could. As much avgas as possible was pumped rapidly. Soon, I ordered all hands off the foredeck. We retreated to a safe area between the forward 40mm mount and the forward bulkhead. Within moments after the foredeck had been cleared, the 8-inch tow line parted and whipped back across the deck and hit the 40mm gun shield with astounding force, bending the half-inch steel armor plate. Fortunately, no one was hurt. The officer on deck on the bridge saw the casualty and immediately stopped fueling operations, breaking away while not completely topped off, but with sufficient fuel and avgas to meet the next operation. Elsewhere, there were signs that things were getting out of the ordinary. The cruiser Boston had been forced to ramp up its speed to hold station with the carrier Yorktown, which was launching patrol aircraft, but the seas almost threw the ships together. Elsewhere, an escort carrier running anti-submarine duty was pitching so badly that an Avenger was waved off, only for the deck to rise faster than the aircraft could, causing the tail hook to catch anyway. The plane was yanked out of the air, the hook tore off, and the stricken aircraft spun out of the sky to crash into the sea just to port. Luckily, the three men aboard were quickly rescued. Soon, reports were coming in from all over the fleet. It wasn't just tow lines. Fuel lines and anything else connecting supply ships with their charges were separating as seas yanked ships apart as often as they were pushing them dangerously close together. All over the fleet, destroyers that had only been partially fueled were being forced to break off, and the oilers were reporting that further operations were being slowed by the need to replace or repair broken fuel hoses, something they only had a limited supply of to start with. Casualty reports were also coming in as ever more violent seas threw men who were on deck trying to wrangle hoses and supplies up against various parts of their ships. Somewhat oddly, noon arrived aboard USS New Jersey, Admiral Halsey's flagship, with the Admiral taking lunch whilst observing USS Hunt and USS Spence trying to refuel from the battleship, only for Spence to roll sharply, be hauled away from the New Jersey, and then thrown about bow first straight at the flagship. Luckily, another wave and some quick work on the destroyer's bridge slewed the Spence around and disaster was averted for the moment, but she was forced to haul off covered in oil with little of that additional fuel actually in her tanks to show for it. Perturbed by nearly having an unexpected 2,000 ton lunch guest, Halsey finally called a weather conference. The reports from the Mariners had yet to filter through to Task Force 38, and based on the other available information, the weather forecasters aboard the flagship seemed to think that there was a storm coming their way, but maybe with a cold front between them and it, which it was then hypothesised would shield the fleet from the worst of it. However, in a lesson taken quite clearly from the Prometheus School of Running Away, they recommended a course that was almost directly away from the storm system. And so, a new set of coordinates were given with refuelling to commence the next day, the 18th, at 0700 prompt. Unfortunately, whilst the calculations had suggested the typhoon was about 400 miles away, the more prosaic barometric glass devices were already beginning to fall, which combined with the heavy seas was suggesting to more than a few experienced sailors that bad weather was much closer to hand. And indeed they were right, the typhoon was in fact only about 200 miles away and closing. At this stage, it seems the aerologists or weather forecasters were relying much more on distant reports and historic data 
than they were on what was going on outside of the ship. Some vessels, desperately low on fuel, made to try and refuel again during the afternoon, but this universally ended in failure. If they weren't able to fuel shortly after the rendezvous time the next morning, they might be forced to mix diesel, which they held for their generators, in with the last of their fuel oil to try and eke out a few more hours of steaming, and then after that they'd be dead in the water. In desperation, the oiler USS Atacosa even tried to bring back the older method of refuelling astern, where wild swings to port and starboard would be somewhat less of an issue than it was for the otherwise more efficient fuel transfer side-by-side -side method. A new rendezvous point was set slightly further south, but all the updates were actually doing was positioning the fleet more and more towards the dead centre of the oncoming weather. A number of weather officers aboard the replenishment fleet gloomily predicted that at the rate they were going they'd be refuelling ships in the heart of a storm, as they were observing the direction of the waves, the building cloud cover, and other immediately on hand signs of what was to come. Unfortunately, as indicated earlier, there was something of a divide. The majority of the forecasters, or aerologists, were relying on calculations that were based on reports radioed in to them from hundreds of miles away. Relatively few were paying attention to the most obvious signs right outside. As a result, their consensus was that the problem was a bad storm, not a typhoon, and the few weather officers that suggested it was worse, like the officers that were stationed aboard Yorktown and Lexington, appear to have been largely ignored or overruled. By mid-afternoon, the report from the seaplane tender and its mariners finally arrived. This was bad. It put the storm system by this point only 125 miles east and closing, but, as Halsey and his weather officers conferred, they still downplayed the severity of the weather. Since the first two rendezvous points to the northwest hadn't helped to alleviate the weather they were experiencing, a new one was set approximately west-southwest of the fleet's current position. The argument Halsey made was that other courses that headed more directly towards the Philippines would put them in range of Japanese aircraft, and since some carriers were still, barely, able to conduct air operations, a pilot who was willing to die anyway would probably also be willing and able to fly in the predicted weather conditions, which, as said, were still believed to be a storm as opposed to anything larger. The other problem was again the over-reliance on historical and distant data. Various captains through the fleet were using an old sailor's trick, assuming that the centre of the storm was ten points starboard of the direction of the wind. As subsequent investigation would establish, that did in fact point right at the heart of what was coming for them. And what was coming for them was Typhoon Cobra. Aboard USS Calpens, regardless of what word came down from on high, Captain de Bourne ordered the whole ship secured for heavy weather, as did a number of other vessels. All around the fleet, carriers were strapping planes down, double-checking the fuel systems were drained as much as possible, and taking other measures. Aboard various destroyers, ammunition was being carried down into the depths of the magazines, lifelines were being rigged, loose gear was being stowed, and all possible doors and hatches were being closed up. Aboard the carrier's USS Monterey, as well as Cowpens, there was almost a shortage of cabling, as everything from steel wire cable to manila rope to spare mooring line was being used to enclose the air group in a spider's web of impromptu lines, up to a dozen different lines per aircraft. In addition to draining the fueling systems, aboard many carriers they were also draining off as much fuel as they could from the aircraft's tanks, just in case the lines didn't hold. The one thing which divided some in the fleet was the fuel situation. Some destroyers were desperate for fuel, and they trusted Halsey to lead them to safety. These ran high in the water, with near-empty tanks, or in the case of slightly fuller tanks, didn't bother to ballast them. Others scraped what fuel they had into a tank or two and flooded the rest with seawater, or in other cases simply flooded all tanks, relying on the oil floating to the top of the tank and thus still being available to be drawn off. And now came what would turn out to be the final blow. The new rendezvous, the third change signalled thus far, would take some time to reach and was calculated to run the fleet across the path of the storm which was the quickest way to avoid it. 
But now Halsey decided that it would actually be quicker to head for a new point, about halfway between the first and second revised positions. This would, in theory, allow refuelling to start earlier, which would mean that they could get back to airstrikes on the 19th, which was now less than 36 hours away. This would turn out to be a fatal decision. Unknown to them at the time, the first revised position would have meant they'd get hit by the outer edges of the Typhoon's northern side. The second position would have been at the edge of the Typhoon's southern side. The new position had the fleet running directly before the storm once again back to the Prometheus school of fleeing. Now they were running essentially with the Typhoon, except the Typhoon was faster than they were. The new course would have the storm system run over the fleet with just about the northern side, which was the more violent side, where the wind was augmented by the general direction of travel, passing solidly over the fleet, with the eye just about skirting them. The fleet completed its turn to this new course just before 2300 on the night of the 17th, and almost immediately the barometers began to drop faster than a kamikaze zero on final approach. Aboard the trailing ships, the, with their nice new PPI indicator equipped radar, an ominous sign began to emerge with every sweep. Normally, the screen would show a scattering of glowing dots, the various nearby ships of Task Force 38. Now, this was being overlaid on the longer range screens from the east by steadily advancing arms of sweeping returns from sea and sky. The radar operators, of course, had no idea what they were looking at, but they were some of the first to witness the arrival of a major weather event on radar. The destroyer USS Alwyn briefly lost power just before 0300 in the morning, disabling her steering. Fast work got a backup generator online, but it was a close-run thing. An hour or so later, the weather officer aboard New Jersey, still unwilling to call the storm that was approaching them a typhoon, began polling some of the other ships for their ideas. All predictions of the location of the storm disagreed, and were spread out. Any course change would evade two of the guesses, but run into the third. The bigger problem was that they all thought the storm was still 150 to 200 miles away. In fact, by 0500, Cobra was barely 50 miles out and closing. But as even the mighty New Jersey began to roll heavily with the waves, Halsey cancelled the last ordered rendezvous and ordered all ships to turn south and run for it. But it was too late. Any ship that complied would unknowingly be essentially putting itself dead centre for Cobra. And so the end game began. At about 0500, USS Cushing observed the wind, which was thus far coming from the east, do a complete 180 and start to increase speed from 40 to 60 knots. As the wind and waves wheeled around and the skies boiled in the early morning light, the fleet found the sea chasing them south, pitching them up by the stern and forcing them around into the following waves. Soon, yaw and roll were added to vertiginous pitch, each ship recording things slightly differently as the typhoon gradually overtook them one by one and the wind and sea conditions continuously changed direction. Aboard a fleet oiler, breakfast was ruined as the mess deck tables all collapsed at once after a particularly bad roll. Aboard Yorktown, the men resorted to a system of waiting for a moment of stability, stuffing as much food into their mouths as humanly possible, and then holding onto their plates as the ship heeled over, quietly chewing and swallowing if they could, and waiting for the next level period to allow them to grab another bite. Aboard the destroyer USS The Sullivans, the men on watch reported one moment facing nothing but a wall of black water rising high above them, then they were deluged as the bow smashed headlong into the waves, and moments later, with salt spray stinging their eyes, they were afforded a brief view of the fleet that was more often enjoyed by carrier pilots before the destroyer came racing down into the next trough. On one destroyer escort, the crew bound the chains of their bunks so that they rested at a 45 degree angle to the bulkhead instead of lying flat, just to avoid being thrown out. On one carrier, a sailor whose bunk lay right below an expansion joint played chicken with the ship and his fingers by amusing himself by placing pennies in the gap in the expansion joint as the ship hogged and then seeing what happened to them when the gap opened up again on the next wave. One young sailor had a duty station on the flight deck of USS Yorktown. 
He took one look at the 30-foot walls of water rolling down the flight deck and decided to stay within the ship's island. Partway through his watch, the officer of the deck approached him and asked, Is everything secure on the flight deck? Uh, I guess so, sir, the ensign replied. I haven't actually been out there. Well, what do you mean you haven't been out there? That's your station, isn't it? Uh, yes, sir, but if you go out there, you'll die. Uh, the ensign heard another sea's worth of water thundering down the flight deck and opened the aft hatch of the island of Fraction. You look through there, he told the officer of the deck. The officer took a look and then ducked back in, looked at the sailor, went, Oh my God, and walked away. Unsurprisingly, there was absolutely no chance that any refueling was going to take place that morning, although as a last-ditch measure, some destroyers, critically low on fuel, were sent in the direction of the fleet carriers, which were in turn ordered to turn somewhat broadside to whichever direction the wind and the waves were coming from at that hour in an effort to provide a sheltered area via their sheer mass. The idea was that the destroyers could then take on at least a few hours of fuel from the carriers in the lee side, but the seas were too rough for even this to work, and the effort just caused a number of further casualties. As the morning progressed towards noon, the worst of the typhoon began to overhaul the fleet. Aboard the light carrier USS Monterey, one Lieutenant Gerald R. Ford was climbing a ladder on his way up to the bridge when the ship was thrown so violently over to port that he was torn off the ladder and sent sliding and tumbling across the flight deck towards the boiling seas. His life was saved by a small lip of metal at the edge of the flight deck that was designed to stop small tools and parts from rolling off the ship in calmer weather. This arrested his progress just enough that when he went over the edge, he fell straight down into the catwalk that housed the ship's anti-aircraft battery instead of ski ramping off and over the side completely. This left him cold, bruised, and having to face traversing the interior of the ship back over to the starboard side to try to get back to his duty station once again. Elsewhere, crewmen, struggling to keep an eye on things through horizontal rain, were forced to watch their carefully lashed down aircraft try to take to the skies as wind speeds reached a point where even the relatively small areas of the wings that were left horizontal after the bulk of them had been folded up were generating enough lift that the planes were trying to head for the skies. Aboard Monterey, the rolls reached up to 70 degrees and at this angle even the extra cabling couldn't hold the aircraft down. The world's first VTOL Hellcat upended itself along with four others and vanished over the side. More and more aircraft started to break free and it was only a matter of time before something even worse happened. Aboard Independence, things weren't exactly going swimmingly either. The worst of the storm hit just before noon. Great pyramidal waves built up and crashed into the ship. It was frightening to look up from the flight deck, which was some 60 feet above a waterline, and see giant waves towering another 30 feet above, almost obscured by the spray and spume whipping off of it by a monster wind. After the fueling was finished, I was assigned to the patroller flight deck, which was rigged with vertical spoilers, six-foot metal posts attached to the tie-down racks, to break up the direct wind. My orders were to check the safety of the planes and pass information to the bridge on the status of the plane's strap with wires and ropes to the tie-down racks on a flight deck. On one trip around the decks, I held on to the spoilers to avoid being blown overboard. I glanced, I glanced aloft at the anemometer, its three cups whirling furiously, only to see it spin off its mountain and still spin and madly fly across the flight deck and into the sea on the port side. When I went to the bridge to take the noon to 1600 office on deck watch, I asked the quartermaster about the wind velocity. He reported that before the anemometer disintegrated, the wind had registered 114 knots. The fleet was still forging south. They were now running almost perpendicular to the typhoon's path, but it was now so close that this was actively making things worse. But if you broke formation and headed southeast or east-southeast, i.e. into the waves, then you ran the risk of cutting across or running straight into another ship, and only the worst affected ships thus broke formation once they felt they had absolutely no choice. Langley, CVL-27, managed to roll up to 70 degrees at one point. Seven planes on Cowpens, CVL-25, were washed overboard, and one plane that broke loose started a fire that was quickly extinguished. On San Jacinto, CVL-30, a fighter plane broke loose in the hangar, and smashed seven other aircraft to pieces. But Monterey, CVL-26, fared the worst, 
Although they'd largely been defuelled, it was impossible to completely empty the aircraft's tanks with the onboard equipment, and a Hellcat in the hangar broke free and smashed into its neighbour, rupturing the fuel tank and dragging both into the bulkhead, which threw off sparks, which ignited the spilled fuel, which set off an explosion that then grew to envelop the middle third of the hangar. The firefighting station was breached, and all the controls were doused in burning fuel, and so the sprinklers stayed off. The fires burned through many of the lines holding down the other aircraft, and more and more of them started to careen around the hangar, adding their own fuel to the growing inferno that, rather predictably, spread to engulf the entirety of Monterey's hangar. Paradoxically, for a ship currently caught in the middle of a massive typhoon, it was now at significant risk of burning down to the waterline. And then it got worse. Some of the explosions had breached the ventilation ducts that were supplying the boiler rooms, and so soon thick, toxic, hot smoke was flooding into the machinery spaces. Unable to see or breathe, the boiler rooms and all but one engine room had to be rapidly evacuated by the crew. Of course, this meant the ship began to lose steam pressure, the force behind the pumps and what sprinklers had been manually activated began to fall, uh, which was made worse by a lot of water already on the flight deck following the smoke down the ventilation shafts, which also, also partly flooded the boiler rooms. Electrical power was the next to go, leaving the crew aboard a dark, swaying, firelit death trap. One sailor lost his footing and went over the side. A crewmate, seeing him vanish, acted quite swiftly and threw a now limp fire hose after him, which gave the incredibly lucky man in the water something to grab hold of and haul himself back up on. Then steering and engines began to go, threatening to send the ship broadside to the waves. The engineering crew had grabbed whatever respirators and other gear they could find elsewhere in the ship and tried to head back in, but this was only partially successful. The sluicing water in some of the boiler rooms had begun to boil itself, filling the air with a mixture of steam, soot and smoke, and scalding anyone who tried to get in it. Up above, the flames were seeking any escape route they could get, and explosions began to rock the ship as they forced their way into more ventilation ducts, touching off whatever they found wherever they happened to emerge. The flight deck began to buckle as the steel beams supporting it began to soften and bend in the heat, and the temperatures in the ready-use ammunition lockers began to climb dangerously. Captain Ingersoll had to make a choice. With a limited power, he could fight the typhoon or the fire, but not both. Judging the more immediate threat was ammunition detonation, he ordered the engines stopped and all remaining boiler power diverted to the pumps and other equipment. As it turned out, this was the perfect choice, as the winds were so strong, the carrier was turned about like a weather vane and driven before them, riding with the waves rather than abreast of them, and gradually the fires began to die. It had cost the lives of three men, with dozens more wounded, but the ship would survive, and eventually regain power, before the heart of the storm passed over it. Some of the fleet, under the direct command of Admiral McCain, were ordered to change course and sail straight into the storm. This solved the rolling problem, which in turn saved a number of ships with stability issues, but now they had to trust to the strength of their ships, as they pitched wildly in the waves. Aircraft parked aft were torn loose by solid walls of water that rolled down the entire length of the flight deck, Aboard Yorktown, a signalman gazed out from his position, normally 65 foot above the surface of the ocean, as the crest of a wave passed by 25 feet above him. Other ships shook not just from the impact of the waves, but because their screws were being lifted out of the water as they surged over the crests of the waves, which left the engines racing at the sudden lack of resistance. Aboard a number of ships, the crews were ordered to don life jackets as some small measure of insurance just in case the ship happened to break up around them at any given moment. Aboard the battleship USS Washington, a monster wave slammed into the ship and, amongst other things, sent two officers in the chart house, along with the sofa they were sitting on, clean across the 80-foot width of the ship's superstructure. Across the fleet, men trying to make it to help with one reported issue were quite often pinned in place by other safety hazards as furniture, shells, forklifts, jeeps, cutlery, tools, and sometimes other crewmen came flying at them from one way and then the other. Quite a few simply had to find whatever hard shelter there was and hunker down, or else play a lethal 3D game of Frogger, 
bouncing off of walls that had very recently been largely vertical before the floor resumed this more traditional role. Simply put, if it wasn't bolted down, it was now out to get you, and sometimes even the bolted down items were finding new and interesting ways of getting free. Aboard USS Calpins, a combination of waves and rolls meant at one point a bridge officer was able to put his arm out the window and scoop water straight out of the ocean, whilst on deck a pair of Avengers broke loose. One, accompanied by a pair of jeeps, took leave of the situation over the side, whilst the other, with one wheel locked up and the other one freely turning, swept about the flight deck in great arcs as it spun and slid around, almost like some extremely drunk tiger lunging after the few deck crew brave or suicidal enough to try and wrangle it. A while later, a Hellcat got loose, flipped over and exploded, whilst 1,600-pound anti-shipping bombs in the magazines left their cradles and began rolling around, crashing into and crushing things with enough force that it could be heard through most of the ship. In order to use the wind to direct the flames over the side instead of into the hangar, Calpins was forced to head right for the eye of the storm. The tactic actually worked. The burning fighter, as well as five other aircraft, were blown clean over the side, along with the radar array, as well as, sadly, the ship's air officer, who'd been helping to coordinate the firefighting efforts. Somewhat belatedly, at 11.49 in the morning, Halsey ordered the rest of the fleet to break formation and navigate independently. But by then, it was too late for some. USS Spence, DD-512, a Fletcher class, as we've mentioned earlier, had previously tried to refuel from Halsey's flagship, but with that exercise ending in failure, she had been left with just 15% fuel. She had then been ordered to accompany the Euler Group in order to refuel at the first opportunity, which meant that she kept her fuel tanks empty for too long. As the weather grew worse during the morning, she finally began flooding the empty tanks. But it was too late. A violent roll saw water enter through the ventilator ducts, Amongst other places, it poured into the electrical distribution room and short-circuited the distribution board. Left without electrical power, she then found her rudder had jammed hard right. Out of control, and completely dark, at about 11.10, Spence took a deep roll to port, recovered, then took another one, and vanished forever, going down with 317 of her crew, leaving only 23 clinging to whatever was left afloat. At 1100, the Farragut-class destroyer USS Hull, DD-350, was facing winds of well over 100 knots. Although she was lucky enough to have 70% of her fuel remaining, she also had almost 500 tonnes of additional equipment up top to compare to what she'd had when she'd been launched. She needed every bit of ballast she could get, but she hadn't topped her tanks up with water either. Trapped in formation, Hull was rolling 50 degrees, and about the time that Halsey's order to break formation came in, she was rolling 70 degrees and completely unable to steer. Several such rolls were experienced by the crew before a particularly strong gust of wind that was estimated at over 110 knots came in, just as she took a particularly heavy roll, and the wind pinned her down. Water then poured through her funnels, and she capsized and sank a few minutes after noon, with 202 of her crew still aboard, leaving 62 survivors in the water. USS Monaghan, DD-534, was another Farragut class in pretty much the same situation as Hull. She too attempted to ballast down at the last minute, but various valves stuck, and therefore here too water began to pour into the ship from ventilator ducts and broken hatches. By 11.30, Monaghan had lost electrical power and the steering engine failed. After a few heavy rolls, she also foundered just before noon, along with 256 of her crew, leaving only six survivors. It was a cruel end for a ship that had earned 12 battle stars and had started its war by attacking a Japanese midget submarine inside Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941. She'd subsequently seen action at Midway and the Battle of Komondorsky Islands, amongst many other actions. Fellow classmates Dewey and Alwyn almost met the same fate. Dewey stayed afloat largely thanks to the sea smashing off her funnel, which reduced the sail area of the ship, along with considerable bailing and pumping by the crew. Alwyn had lost her engines and steering control, rolled 70 degrees to port, and hung there for 20 minutes. 
somehow Lieutenant Commander W.K. Rogers essentially managed to drift the ship sideways through the typhoon, even as the engine rooms had to be evacuated as rising heat made the compartments completely unlivable. But credit for this survival also has to go to the ship's engineering officer, Lieutenant E.R. Rendell, and machinist mate uh, T. Serensky, who both remained at their posts despite the overwhelming heat in order to protect the electrical circuits and give the ship some chance. When they were finally forced out through the escape hatches by the appalling conditions, the escape hatch was so narrow they had to remove their life jackets. They managed to reach the deck where they were witnessed to collapse due to the sudden radical temperature shift, and in that state they were sadly washed overboard before anyone could reach them. Thanks to their last actions, the pumps stayed running just enough to keep ahead of the incoming water, and Alwyn gradually limped back upright just after noon passed. USS San Jacinto almost went the same way. As on Monterey and Calpins, one plane got loose and liberated others in the hangar deck. These shattered lockers and other restraints that sent spare parts and tools, which amounted from everything the size of a screw all the way up to a spare engine or two, rolling free with the gradually disintegrating aircraft for company. Soon, the carrier resembled something more like a washing machine filled with rubble as the storm of razor-edged metal shredded everything in the hangar. In a small irony, one of the larger chunks of aircraft hit a button that then set off the sprinkler system, which now meant the hangar was awash with water and foam as well, which made keeping your feet impossible. The metal storm ripped open ducts, vents and bulkheads, emitting the seat into the engineering spaces via the vents, and then the hangar paradoxically caught fire as leaking fuel resting on top of the water and foam, as well as fumes, caught sparks from broken electrical lines. This left the sailors with little choice, and they ended up swarming up the gantries, walkways and beams that hung from the flight deck that was also the roof of the hangar, and, tied on with ropes, were left to perform a pendulum-like ballet of firefighting as the ship rolled back and forth. On a somewhat lighter note, Charles Edwin Emer had volunteered to act as the flagship's lookout. Before the weather had gotten quite so bad, he'd climbed up past USS New Jersey's 011 level, and then up the foremast to what in older times had been called a crow's nest. Now, firmly tied into position, he found himself with pretty much the best view of the fleet, as the roles of the battleship were translated, thanks to his great distance from the centre of rotation, into the world's wildest and wettest roller coaster, describing an arc of several hundred feet with each roll. At 1314, which was actually after the worst of the violence had passed, Halsey issued a typhoon warning. The first official traffic, incidentally, referencing a typhoon. This was primarily directed to the rest of the world, but it was also picked up by a number of ships in the fleet, at least those that still had radio equipment intact. One can imagine the response of those vessels. Still, by the point the signal went out, the storm was beginning to ebb. Over the next few hours, the winds dropped below 100 knots, then below 80 and then by 1500 they were a merely pedestrian 50 knots. As it was now clear that the worst was over, the reality of the fleet's lack of fuel was still present, but with darkness swiftly coming on, there was nothing that could be done that day, and so a new refuelling rendezvous was set for the following morning. Amidst the chaos came the unlikeliest of heroes, the pint-sized destroyer escort USS Tabara DE-418. She had suffered as much as anybody else. The seas had shattered and washed away the entire foremast and its accompanying radio antenna, and she was rolling so far past her inclinometer's red zone that the indicator had long since gone stuck. But most reckon she was averaging 60 degrees per roll. Then, as the sun began to set, the ship surged over a wave and into comparative calm. The waves were still throwing the ships about like a toy, but, almost as if passing through a wall, the wind and the rain mostly vanished. Up ahead, they spotted the truncated form of USS Dewey, and in the absence of radio, signalled by light, I've lost my mast. The reply came back, cheer up, I've lost my stack. Other ships then began to emerge into the squalling conditions at the back of the storm, and the crew began making repairs, when suddenly they spotted a light to starboard. US Navy life jackets of the time came with a whistle and a light, 
So her captain, Lieutenant Commander Henry L. Plage, or Plage possibly, hauled his battered ship around and set off after it. Finding the light was attached to a life jacket that itself contained a waving sailor, Tabra tried to get close, but the wind and the sea was still strong enough to push her off course. So she steamed upwind and then turned broadside to the weather. The much less top-heavy destroyer escort rolled heavily again, but was judged relatively unlikely to capsize and was gradually pushed down towards the man, which had the additional advantage of partially shielding him with the hull. Sailors volunteered to man a rescue party even as solid water rolled over the ship's deck and they threw him a line. Between the rolling and the waves, by the time the next crest of water had rolled over them and everyone had cleared their eyes, the water had actually deposited the man on the deck for them. It was Ken Drummond, one of the lucky few left from USS Hull. The Dewey, spotting the destroyer escort searchlight and hearing broken close-range radio chatter of survivors, tried to move in and help, but that involved steaming into the head seas and, with likely structural damage from earlier, she was forced to break off. Back aboard Tabra, Drummond's information that Hull had sunk was the first that anyone in the fleet knew about ships having gone down. Knowing that there were other men out there, Plage commenced a box search regardless of the sea conditions and forged on. Soon he came across another survivor, and then another. Soon the ship's crew developed an effective and entirely improvised system. Every man who could be spared tied themselves to some vantage point and scanned the seas. The strongest swimmers volunteered to have themselves tied to heavy lifelines and donned life jackets. To give the crew the best chance of seeing or hearing something, every light externally was doused and every ventilation blower was shut down. The crew then strained to spot life jacket lights or hear the whistles, and when one was spotted the ship's lights went on and the searchlights were trained out. Using the technique they'd just invented to rescue Drummond, the ship would go upwind, then drift down, and if the survivor looked strong, lines would be thrown out. If he looked weak, several men would dive over and swim out to him, whilst the other designated swimmers manned the cargo net to help them back aboard. Without her primary radio, and with other ships low on fuel or heavily damaged, the Valiant destroyer escort forged on alone. Admiral Halsey appears to have been more concerned with getting fuel into his ships, which is understandable, and then getting back promptly to bombing the Japanese on Luzon, which is perhaps less understandable as a priority given the circumstances. And so, although all ships were ordered to look out for survivors, this was only on their routes to the rendezvous and then on to Ulithi. No other ships were assigned to dedicated search and rescue, and indeed Tabra seems to have pu pulled a lesson from Nelson at Copenhagen and conveniently failed to respond to any and all orders to leave the area for the next two days. As the seas calmed, another element was added to Tabra's deck plan. Squads of riflemen, for there was enough edible debris in the water, along with survivors, that sharks were appearing in worrying quantities. As the dawn broke on the 19th, the battered but somehow still alive form of Hull's captain was spotted and brought aboard. A lot of the men that were hauled up out of the sea were essentially torture victims. Some had been smashed against their ship's hulls when they went down, and once in the water, assuming they hadn't been hit by debris, they had open sores that had been chafed into them by their life jackets, which would then continue to rub salt water into the wounds. The pummeling wind and waves would wrench limbs and batter and bruise faces in a manner more consistent with a very badly lost boxing match followed by a fall down several flights of stairs. It was scarce wonder that so many needed help getting back aboard. That anyone who'd ridden out Typhoon Cobra for almost 24 hours with nothing but a Kapok life jacket for company was capable of moving under their own power was something of a minor miracle. One of the volunteer swimmers themselves had something of a close call when, with a bit too much slack in his line, one of Tabra's larger rolls had caught his line on the sonar dome. That was attached to the bottom of the ship. As the ship rolled back, he was yanked underwater. Between swimming and the buoyancy of his life jacket, he managed to get back to the surface to gasp in a breath just before another roll yanked him down again. Three times he was pulled under before the roll slowed long enough for him to get his life jacket off and then swim back to the ship with what little strength he had left. Nonetheless, after a hot drink and a small amount of time warming up, he was found to be back out on deck on swimming duty inside of an hour. Over the course of the evening of the 18th, 
Then, through the 19th and through much of the 20th, Tabora rescued 55 survivors, 41 from the USS Hull and 14 from USS Spence. Towards the end of the 19th, they finally received a message from Halsey that suddenly their equipment was magically capable of picking up. This one was authorization to continue their rescue operations. And then finally they were relieved by two other destroyer escorts later on the 20th. For his actions, Lieutenant Commander Plage would be awarded the Legion of Merit, and Tabra as a whole received the Navy Unit Commendation. The destroyer USS Brown, DD-546, managed to rescue six survivors from Monaghan, the only survivors from that ship, as well as 13 additional survivors from Hull as it passed through the area. Once all the numbers were added up across the fleet, 93 crewmen who'd been washed overboard from still surviving ships, or who had survived the sinking of their ships, were rescued, more than half by the half-shattered destroyer escort. How many more had made it off of their ships but were never found will remain a mystery of the sea. As it turned out, the tail end of the storm made it impossibly choppy closer into Luzon, and the airstrikes that Halsey had hastened to get back to turned out to be impossible anyway. On the 22nd, the entirety of Task Force 38 was therefore turned towards looking for survivors, but by that point anyone still in the water would have spent four nights and three days afloat, and the number found by the Task Force's efforts was minimal. Now it was time to total up the damage. In terms of destroyed or written off aircraft, 146 were gone, one less than the total losses at the Battle of Midway. Three destroyers had gone down when the bulk of Japan's surface combat power off of Samar had only managed to claim five ships. Five light carriers had damage ranging from lost anti-aircraft gun mounts to the gutted interior of the Monterey. Five escort carriers had a similar range of damage. The mighty USS Iowa was running on three shafts, with one of them having been outright bent, forcing the ship to go home. The cruisers Baltimore and Cleveland, along with seven destroyers, four destroyer escorts and three auxiliaries, also had damage to some extent or other that required dockside attention. And almost every other ship in the fleet had some sort of damage that their crews had to work on to make good. And of course, there was the human element. Something around 800 men, some estimates are slightly higher, would never come home. In short, aside from not sinking a fleet carrier, Typhoon Cobra had dealt significantly more damage in a single 24-hour period to the US Navy than any enemy action over the same period of time since the Guadalcanal campaign, or possibly, depending on how you rate damage versus sunk, even Pearl Harbor. Needless to say, there had to be a court of inquiry. This was arranged at Ulithi at the end of the year, and went back and forth across most of the available witnesses, but the broad narrative that emerged was that a good number of officers in the fleet, even some of the weather forecasters, had been pretty certain they were dealing with a typhoon by the middle of the 17th, and most of them had been certain by the fall of the night on that day. Many had used old sailors' rules of thumb, or just cited to the border inquiry passages out of the guidebook that's used by sailors past and present, Knight's Seamanship. It seems only aboard New Jersey and a handful of other places were there resolute holdouts declaiming that it was only a storm. Of course, New Jersey was where Halsey was, and ultimately the court placed responsibility for losses and storm damage on Admiral Halsey, but they didn't go as far as ascribing negligence, stating that Halsey's mistakes were errors in judgment committed under stress of war operations and stemming from a commendable desire to meet military requirements. Looking back, it does seem difficult to ascribe too much blame to Halsey for running the fleet into the typhoon in the first place, as he was mostly going off what his weather staff were telling him. Although some of their suggestions had been overruled by his desire to get back to hitting Luzon ASAP, but once Cobra hit, it seems he consistently made the wrong call. Holding the fleet in formation for as long as he did almost certainly heavily contributed to the loss of the three destroyers, who were then stuck almost beam onto the sea, and is likely almost entirely responsible for the damage sustained to most of the fleet, for pretty much the same reason. 
and his seeming obsession with getting back to the front lines, even after it was clear that most of the fleet was badly damaged, instead of getting the fleet carriers to, say, start an immediate search for survivors, doomed an unknown number of men from both the sunken destroyers and those who'd been washed off of other ships to a slow death in merciless seas. In any event, Halsey would not have any formal charges levelled against him, although whether this was politics or wisdom may be considered in light of the examination of Typhoon Connie, sometimes called Typhoon Viper, which we'll look at at a later date. Fleet Admiral Nimitz perhaps best sums up the lessons of Typhoon Cobra at the end of his analysis, which he sent in the form of a letter shortly thereafter, and with his words, we'll wrap up this video. The time for taking all measures for a ship's safety is while still able to do so. Nothing is more dangerous than for a seaman to be grudging in taking precautions unless they turn out to have been unnecessary. Safety at sea for a thousand years has depended on exactly the opposite philosophy. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.